Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sin like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Keswick Christian Church. Well, again, we're into lockdown and we're on the internet, and I just pray that the Holy Spirit will allow you to take in what Pastor Steve has to say today and that you will find joy in his words because they're God's words. Our reading today is from Colossians, and it's chapter 3, and the verses are... 1 to 17. If then you have been raised up with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from you, your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so that you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds together everything in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and by or and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving or thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning, everyone. One of my favorite pastors and authors is Max Anders. In one of his uh, excellent books, Max writes about this guy. 
Dan Jansen. Do you remember him? Dan Jansen was the Olympic speed skater whose sister Jane died of leukemia just before the 1988 Winter Olympic Games in Calgary. Dan desperately wanted to win the gold medal in her honor, but he failed that year. He tried again four years later in Albertville and came up empty again. He tried one more time at the Winter Games in Norway, Lillehammer, Norway, and not only did he win gold, he also set a world record for the 1,000 meter race. On his emotional victory lap, Dan held his nine-month-old daughter in his arms. Her name was Jane. Jane. Later, Dan was asked how he overcame such adversity. What is it that kept him going? He thought back to the time when he was about 12 years old and he had lost a race. He had lost a meet. The whole drive home, Dan pouted silently as a 12-year-old would while his dad drove. That night, as Dan was going to bed, his dad came into his room and said, Son, life is more than skating in circles. Hmm. And he walked out. That, Jansen said, changed my whole perspective on life. His entire outlook shifted there with his dad's comment. Life is more than skating in circles, isn't it? But be honest. Do you ever feel like your life is hardly more than that? Here we go again. Another lockdown. Repetitive drudgeries, the same old, same old routines, back and back and back. I get up, I shave, I shower, I eat, I work. Maybe your life is full of diapers and dishes. Eat, check the phone, sleep. The next day, same song, second verse, the same tedious circle. And maybe in your experience to make things worse, you find yourself caving to the usual temptations or slipping on the same sin patterns. Round and round, isn't life more than that? Yes, Christian, God made us for far more than just skating in circles. And today's passage in Colossians chapter 3 will take us there. So if you've got your Bibles, great. Look up Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If you don't, hit pause, go find your Bibles, and we'll, we'll read when you get back. Got your Bibles? Good. Let's begin with verse 1, Colossians chapter 3. If then, God says... If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In these verses, God means to shift our outlook, to lift our sights, something like Dan Jensen's dad did for him. God means to raise us to the highest point perspective on reality so that we can begin learning how to live a heaven quality of life here and now. Yes, we were made for far more than spinning in our sin or chasing our tedious tales. Let's pray before we begin. Lord, how we need what you will shape in us today. Teach us, we pray. Remind us whose we are. Renew our mindsets. Lift our longings. Sharpen the focus of our attention. Lord, show us how to live each mundane moment in the reality of heaven, in the reality of our heart's true treasure there. We acknowledge, Lord, that it's you. That treasure 
is you, Jesus. So show us how to live in that light, we pray. For your sake, amen. We have climbed to some astonishing summits in our study through Colossians. In the first two, chapter of Colossians, two, first two chapters of Colossians, you'll remember that we've gotten some really good looks at who our Lord Jesus Christ is in all of his unique preeminence. We've seen that a clear grasp on who Jesus is and what he's done matters, matters eternally for our rescue and it matters for our growth in godliness. We've been warned of ditches to dodge, ditches that will be detrimental in our spiritual walk, man-conceived approaches that deaden us or are downright dangerous dead ends that we dare not fall into. In the process, Paul gave us an unshakable anchor point in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Here's the anchor point. For in him, he says, in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is fully God and fully man. And verse 10, and you have been filled. You've been fully resourced. Everything you need for godliness is in him, in Jesus, fully God, fully man. Add nothing, supplement with nothing, substitute nothing in him who is the head of all rule and all authority. Anchor yourselves there. God is teaching us, anchor your spiritual walk there. Why? Jesus' supremacy, Jesus' preeminence makes him absolutely indispensable, central, key to all of life and to all growth in godliness. However much like skating in circles your life might seem from day to day, Jesus is supremely key to your growth. And so chapter three, as we proceed into it in the subsequent, subsequent weeks, chapter three will show us how key Jesus' supremacy is for our fight against sin, for our growth in grace, and for our primary relationships with others. That's where chapter three is headed. But to do that, God takes us today to the highest possible summit, to the highest possible perspective, to the heights of heaven itself. And he begins by reminding us of the right now reality of our resurrection, the right now reality of our resurrection. See that in verse 1? If then, he says, you have been raised with Christ. Now, if you are trusting Jesus Christ as your own sin taker, as your Savior, your Lord, you have been raised. That's in the past tense, have been raised. What does that mean? You'll remember in John chapter 11, when Jesus told Martha, Lazarus's sister that Lazarus would rise again. Do you remember that? She responded, yes, Lord, I know he will on the last day in the future. Little did she know that in a few moments, Jesus would call Lazarus out of the grave, back from death, back to life bodily, physically, and they, they would have to unwrap him from his grave clothes when he waddled out in response to Jesus' command, Lazarus, come out! And while that resurrection was probably temporary for Lazarus, he probably later died physically, Jesus was demonstrating right then and there that he is the resurrection, that he is the life, that because of him, Physical and spiritual death have no grip on anyone who trusts him. He's indispensable on anyone who takes him as their savior. And we who do will one day be physically raised to life, 
to that indestructible life like Jesus's. Like Hebrews chapter 7 verse 16 says, we will be raised to that indestructible life in glorious bodies like his. As Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 say, we will be in indestructible lives in glorious bodies like his, immortal bodies that are, will no longer be vulnerable to sin, no longer be vulnerable to decay or to disease like they are now. That physical reality, though guaranteed, guaranteed in, in God's word in places like 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans chapter 8, is still ahead of us, still future. It isn't right now, and we don't we know it, right? Because as we get older, as we age, we feel ourselves winding down. It's still ahead and we eagerly wait for that day, that day that Martha was talking about, that resurrection day. So then, what does this mean? You have been raised with Christ. Remember in chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, we saw how Jesus' death in our place, his death as our substitute, his death for us, gave us so much. Oh, there was such a list, wasn't there? Redemption, forgiveness of sins. That was chapter 1, verse 14. More, there was more to his death for us. The long rap sheet of wrongs that rightly condemned us was canceled. That was chapter 2, verse 14. Though we were God's enemies, alienated from him, he gave us peace with God. Reconciliation. That was chapter 1, verses 20 and 22. Reconciliation, peace with God of such a kind that we could stand unblemished in the sight of the judge of the universe and free from accusation. Wow, that's what Jesus' death did for us. But there's something that Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection did with us, not just for us, with us. We learned, do you remember this, in chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, that the instant that we trusted in his death, we trusted in his resurrection as ours. The Holy Spirit so joined us with him, so united us to Jesus, to what Christ did for us, that Jesus not only died and was raised for us, we died with him. We were buried with him and we were made alive with him. Our body of flesh, that old selfish the self that was, that's bent towards sinning, died and was buried with Jesus. Its power was unplugged there. The penalty of that sin was, was, was the penalty of it was done away with when Jesus died for us. But the power of the sin was unplugged with Jesus' death, with our death with Jesus, and we were spiritually brought alive again, plugged in to the whole new capacity and a whole new quality of life in Christ. Not just because of him, with Christ. That's what Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection did with us in our union with him. Because of that, because of that union, because of that being joined to Jesus, the right now reality is that we are alive in Christ. Not just because of him, in him. We're raised with him. Our old self is dead, unplugged. Our new self, our saved self is vibrant with real and resurrection quality of vitality. Because of our connection to Christ right now, you can't get a higher perspective to live than that right there. There's no higher summit to draw life from. This is better than any optimist's club can conjure up because this 
is real. It's real. So, you might ask, how does this perspective make a difference as I skate in circles, as I do my daily life? What do we do with this? How practical is it? Verse 1 continues, seek. Seek the things that are above. This is how to, to, to put that high perspective into practice. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Seek. Circle that word in your Bible. Remember that action. Do, do like an avid treasure hunter does and yearn for, long for, pursue with abandon. Seek. Picture a map of the Western Hemisphere in your mind for a second. That little string of land that connects North and South America, can you picture that? That happens to be one of the world's biggest sources of opals, of opals. Those gorgeous, fiery, multicolored gemstones. I remember as a boy, my buddies and I used to go on outings and we would wade in shallow mountain creeks and scour the riverbeds for those gems, for opals. Mostly what we found were, were beautiful agates or obsidian, but on the rare occasion, we did find opals. <laughs> it just energized our, our search even more. We searched eagerly. We yearned for more. Seek like that. Seek like that. Harness your life's deepest longings, your affections, your aspirations, and aim them high. Aim them heaven high at the things that are above. What things are those? What things are those? The Bible tells us on God's authority that heaven will be still studded with gemstones, far more precious, precious than the whole of earth's opals, than all of them put together. Now, heaven holds wonders that words can't contain. But heaven wouldn't be heaven without its epicenter, without its focal point, where Christ is. Where Christ is, seated, at the right hand of God. All of heaven's treasures will pale. They do now. Next to its greatest treasure, Christ himself, the preeminent one. And notice, do you see what he's doing? That verse tells us right now, in his physical body, he is ascended. He's seated. He's ruling from his rightful throne in full authority at the right hand of God the Father. He is the king. He is the king. Seek your king. Seek your king's character. Aim your highest aspirations, your most ardent affections, your deepest yearnings on Christ, your King, and on His character. Lift your, your greatest longings to your ruler, your ruler, and His righteousness at those things, those things above. Heaven wouldn't be heaven without Him. So ask yourself, prayerfully asking God's presence, Lord, are you my greatest longing? You know. Are you my supreme treasure, Lord? Ask yourself, do I value his rule over me? Do I welcome his authority into over everything, over every corner of my life? Is there any, any corner of my life off limits to him? Do I value what he values? All of the multifacets of his character, of his righteousness. Remember how he said it in Matthew chapter 6? Seek, seek first his kingdom. Seek him, your king, and his righteousness. Are you? Is that what you love to do daily? The place to begin or the place to re-begin is in fresh surrender to him. 
Surrender to him. Tell him. Tell him you treasure him again and again. Repent for letting lesser things corner your greater affections and ask him to let you leave those affections, those, those, the chase after those left, lesser things in their proper corner so that you can aim your highest affections at him. Remember the joy that you felt in him when he rescued you by laying his life down for yours. Remember that joy? Ask him, Lord, re-spark that joy for you, Jesus. I want that again. Blaise Pascal was a French math genius. You remember Pascal, the name. He died in 1662. For 30 years of his life, until he was age 31, he ran from God. But on November 23rd of 1654, at 10.30 p.m., we know because he wrote it down, Pascal was profoundly and unshakably converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote this down on a piece of parchment that he later sewed into his coat that was found eight years later, just after he died. Here's what he wrote about that moment of conversion. Year of Grace, 1654, Monday, 23 November, certitude, heartfelt joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, God of Jesus Christ, joy, 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 tears of joy, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, may I never be separated from him. Respark that joy. Ask God to help you do that in fresh surrender. Aim your best affections heaven high and don't stop there. Keep going like verse 2 tells us to set. Don't just seek. Set your minds on things that are above, again, not on things that are on earth. We need to make a choice. We need to make deliberate daily choices. What is it? that will dominate my mind? What is it that will flood my thinking? Where should the course of my thinking concentrate? Rivet your attention, your mind set. Let the stream of your thinking flow there to the epicenter of heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The summer that Kathy and I were engaged, I think I've told you this before, I was in Dallas. She flew off to faraway Phoenix for the whole summer. It might as well have been Mars. It was fairly traumatic for me. I think I'll just keep telling you that. Guess where my thoughts were that whole summer? Not in Dallas. I could tell you that. Here's a fact. Our attention Our thoughts naturally flow, constantly flow towards what we love the most. Setting our minds on things above doesn't mean that we have to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. D.L. Moody was famous for saying that. No, we we need to pay attention to the things that we're responsible for on earth, don't we? It does mean, though, that we are so preoccupied in heart and head, preoccupied with the priorities of our preeminent one, that even the mundane, even the trivial, even what feels like the tedious routine of each day falls into its proper place. The famous renowned preacher from a previous century, Alexander McLaren, compared this setting our minds like being on a hike. Picture this, being on a hike in a mountainous region someplace where the lower hills, the closer, inferior, uh, tedious summits that we have to climb each day are put into perspective when they're in line with the culminating peak when they're in line with the culminating peak. That peak that all the smaller peaks aspire to, 
and find their perfection in that one calm summit that touches the skies. He said, the more we have in view as our aim, our greatest aim in life, Christ, who is at the right hand of God, and we have in mind our affections and our attention are about our union with him, about our communion with him, about seeking his approval over all. The more, he says, will all immediate aims be ennobled. All immediate aims be delivered from the evils that otherwise would cleave, would cleave to them. How true. How true. So, how frequently do your thoughts gravitate towards your king on high? Do thoughts of him dominate your thinking? Do, your, do thoughts of him and his heaven quality of character, are they what you value most? One of the refrains from a chorus just keeps going over and over through my mind with eternity, with eternity's values in view, Lord. With eternity's values in view, may I do each day's work for Jesus with eternity's values in view. Setting our minds on things above takes that tedious, and elevates it to a useful and profound weight of glory into something that really matters to Jesus. Imagine even changing a diaper, if that's the life stage you're in. Imagine even taking out the trash can delight Jesus that you can hear from this point. You can imagine him saying, well done, Good and faithful servant. It all depends on where you put your longings when you do that little task. Is it there or is it here? Why does this highest of all perspectives work? Why does this seeking and setting work? Well, verses 3 and 4 tell us that. They wrap up this section by telling us. See verse 3? For you have died. When was that? Your old self died with Christ, in union with Christ. And your life now is hidden with Christ in God. It's not a reality that we can see or that we can touch. It's invisible. We just take God's word for it. But that hiddenness that we're told is true of us right now, with Christ. That hiddenness means that our new life is secure. It's, sec it's doubly secure. Did you see that? With Christ in God. It's very similar to what Jesus described in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, when he said, no one can snatch this life from us. Why? Because we're in his hand and in his father's hand. Doubly secure. We are so secure that verse 4 goes on to say, when Christ, who is your life, appears in the future, then you also will appear with him in glory. In glory. The Lord Jesus Christ is our very life right now. Do you remember how he said it in John 17, 3? This is eternal life. This is the heaven quality of life. That they may know you, God, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus Christ is our very life. Because we know him, as we aim our affections, as we rivet our attention on him, he teaches us. He fully resources us to live a heaven quality of life now. His character quality of life now. One that knows how to fight decisively against sin. One that knows how to grow in the excellencies of his grace. And one that reflects his splendor in all of our primary relationships now. That's where the rest of this chapter is going. But that's not the end of it. That's not the finish line. 
Life isn't about skating in circles. There is a finish line. Here's a description of it. 1 John 3, chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, isn't visibly obvious yet. But we know that when he does appear, we shall be like him in fully resurrected, glorified bodies like his, as his radiant, holy, unblemished bride, his church. Why? The verse says it. Because we shall see him as he is, face to face, eye to eye. We shall see him as he is. Today, God is raising us to the highest perspective on reality, letting us look down from heaven, almost looking down from heaven, seeing what's ahead. He's reminding us of our right now resurrection privilege so that we can begin learning how to live a heaven quality of life. Jesus, our King's quality of life here and now. We were made for far more than skating in circles, far more than just spinning in sin or chasing our tails here. Christian, you and I were made to thrive with Jesus' very life in us, out of the very character of heaven's king. We were made for glory, for glory. Let's learn how to live today, not just in light of that day, but in light of that access we have now to heaven's quality of life. Let's pray. Lord, that will be glory. Glory for me. Glory for me. Glory for me. When at last his face I will see by his grace, that will be glory. In the meantime, Lord, we are so grateful for the way that you have given us a glimpse of what is true right now. The beautiful access to your character and your quality of life right now because of our union with you, in you. Lord, again, we surrender afresh to your rule over us, to your absolute rule in us. Lord, may your righteousness be what our character takes on, we pray, as we live from this highest of perspectives, in Jesus' name, amen.